Um, <clears throat> any questions about any of the topics that we discussed over the last few classes? The, the topics we, one second, the topics <laughs> relating to um, multiple page sites. That is having a master page, having nested master pages. One thing that we didn't cover um, is putting code in master pages, but that's certainly able to be done. Um, likewise, code in descendants from the master page, you can certainly do that. The trickiest thing is a code on a child calling something on the parent. That's a little trickier to do. It is possible, though. Um, then we talked about some navigational things. We talked about XML. We talked about the site map. All these things taken together sort of form uh, tools that you can use for creating a multiple page site. You had a question. When you're doing, um, one is tree view and what's the other one, menu view Radio. or something? Yeah. Um, if, if I don't want my navigation over the left, if I want it uh -huh. go, like this across the top, is there an easy way without doing all tons of funky CSS to just make yeah, there's an the children of that? There's an orientation attribute. No, I don't mean just to make it go across, but that when you click on one of them that has things underneath it that they should go right down because mine went like over and to the right when I clicked on it and I want them to go straight down underneath. So you want to be oriented horizontally but the children oriented vertically. I don't know the answer to that. There is I, like I, I don't think I don't think there's an easy way. Oh, I thought right. it would be like because you see so many set up like that. I think I was. Well, there's some research. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean I looked and looked and I couldn't find an easy way so I just had to make it, but I expected there to be something much easier. It seems like somebody should make it. Well, go for it then. <laughs> you can, do remember that you can extend the ASP.NET building classes if you want to have a certain uh, behavior and, and stuff, so that, that would be a possibility. I guess I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Uh, I believe they give you an orientation, but it, it, as, yeah, as you that, noticed, go ahead. But as you notice, the orientation seems to be orientation for everything. You can't choose to have the, the parents oriented one way and the children oriented the other way. Uh, other questions? All right. So the one thing I want to emphasize is uh, we're going to cover some loose ends here. some loose ends here. Oh, there it is. And uh, we'll get to those in a minute here. But I guess I guess the the thing that I want to emphasize is these things work if you plan ahead. In other words, if you just start throwing together pieces of code and you just sit down and you just start throwing together pieces of code, all right, um, you can make a non-maintainable website with a framework, all right? So uh, it, it, is, it is your right, as guaranteed by the Constitution, to write bad code regardless of what platform you're on. So the fact that ASP.NET provides you a framework that allows you to do some things and do some things very quickly and in a consistent manner is no guarantee that your code is going to be maintainable. It nudges you in the right direction. All right. However, that being said, it can't force you to do things the right way. So, for example, with master pages, you know, you need to think through the design of your site. All right, before you develop it. And again, for those of you who have CISS 216, by and large it comes down to the number of wireframes you have. Right? If you have one wireframe for your site, which is not unexpected in a small site, then you probably just have one master page. If, however, you have a couple different wireframes on your site, uh, in other words, some pages have a sub-navigation, some pages don't. All right. 
uh, or some pages are laid out slightly different than others. You know, maybe a photo gallery page is laid out different than uh, another kind of content page. Then it probably would benefit you to do two master pages. Now, are they going to be two separate standalone master pages or are they going to be master pages that inherit off of each other? Well, one's the master master page and the other uh, is sort of a second level master page. All these things, you know, you're not probably going to sit down and just start typing in your code into a keyboard and come up with good answers to these questions. You're going to do whatever pops in your head or the path of least resistance or however you want to call it. Therefore, it's important to think through, you know, when we talk about design, we talk about design on a bunch of different levels, right? Um, we're going to be getting into databases soon, so that's a big aspect of the design, getting the database down right and getting the structure down right, uh, because that, in by and large, is the foundation of your application, all right? Um, structuring your code, that is your business logic. Where does the business logic live? Um, how is that code going to be designed? What classes do you need? What are those functions going to look like? That's an aspect of design. Um, what your pages... Sorry. Sorry. What your pages are going to look like. That's an aspect of design. That's an aspect of visual design. All right. How you can take the .NET components and build the pages to be very maintainable. That's an aspect of design, all right? So design cuts across everything. And, and uh, you know, a lot of people, again, when they hear web design, erroneously think uh, that it's talking about colors and fonts and all that. That's, a, that's, a, that's one aspect of it. It's an important aspect, but it's not the only aspect. And I might hesitate to say that it, it might not even be the most important aspect uh, of the site, all right? One thing that we implied, but we didn't go over in a great detail, is figuring out how to structure your site from a logical viewpoint. All right? In other words, any topic that you pick can be divided a bunch of different ways. You can categorize the, the subtopics in your topic a bunch of different ways. All right? If we were doing a website for Lorraine Community College, we could break stuff down by department. All right? Stuff that's in the business division, stuff that's in the engineering, stuff that's in allied health, and so on. All right? We could break it down by general career areas, IT related programs, healthcare related programs, science related programs, and so on. We could break it down by whether you are a high school student looking to start higher education for the first time, whether you are someone that is looking to re-enter or retrain themselves uh, into a different field, or whether you're someone that's completed their education and is coming back for additional education, either to augment what they've learned or to possibly branch out in a slightly different direction. In addition, there's members of the community that might not be interested really in taking credit classes necessarily, but they might be interested in non-credit classes. Or they might be interested in some credit classes, but they don't really have uh, a, 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 a formal educational goal. This is just more of a, a broader general um, a personal enrichment. Now, any of those three or four ways that I described are logical ways of dividing the content on the site. All right? They're logical. They make sense. Um, the question is, is what is the best? What is the best way? And that's where you have to know something about the problem, and that's where you have to know something about the people that are going to be viewing the site and what their goals are and how they see the content. For example, you know, Many colleges realize that people outside the college don't really know a lot about the internal departments of a college, right? I mean, um, different schools have uh, computer programming classes in different areas. Some have it in engineering, some have it in business, some have it in math and sciences. We probably have it in a lot of. We probably have computer programming courses in, in several different divisions. 
So if all you know is you're interested in computers, breaking down the content by division, by academic division, isn't necessarily going to be helpful. You may stumble across the business division's programming page uh, that deals with the business division's programming classes and not realize that there might be something better suited for you in engineering or in arts and sciences or, or so on. So you've got to be able to put yourself. This is a whole field, by the way. This is, you know, this is something I'm spending half a lecture on, or not even that. But yet it's a whole field. Uh, it, it is called, typically it's called information architecture. And you talk about developing taxonomies. You know, the, the most famous taxonomy uh, is, you know, uh, animals, how, how living things are categorized. You know, there's plants and animals. There is, uh, you know, uh, under... Under animals, there's birds, fish, mammals, reptiles, amphibians. There might be a few other categories in there. I'm not, I don't know anything about this, really. All right. Underneath mammals, there are dogs, cats, monkeys, people, and so on. All right. Now, is that the only way that you could categorize that information? No. You could, biologists could have, categorized the living world by size. Tiny, small, medium, and big. That could be the four categories of living things. Tiny would be like the microscopic stuff. Small would be stuff that is way smaller than people are. Medium would be things that are around the same size as people. And then large would be stuff that's bigger than people. So trees and whales would be in the big stuff category. Now, the question is, you know, that's a logical way of doing it. You know, you could categorize living things by that. But biology just found that for their topic, all right, that isn't particularly useful, all right? In other words, a tree, which is bigger than people, has more in common with a flower that's smaller than people than it has with a whale, all right? So... The point is, is when you're developing your topic and you're looking at it, don't necessarily sell yourself automatically on the first way of organizing it that pops into your mind. Take, try to take a step back and consider what some of the alternatives are, and don't base your decision based on what makes most sense to you, but what you would expect your users to get the most sense out of. Now, depending on the size of the project, you know, you can run focus groups and present them prototypes of the project and observe them and, and all that. I doubt if any of you are going to go to that effort uh, for your semester project. But again, at the very least, try to put yourself in the user's shoes and think about, hmm, how are the typical people, typical categories of people that are visiting the site going to view the material? What's going to be most likely to them? most likely way that they're going to view it. So again, these things happen only when there's planning. So um, after I, I tie up a few loose ends here, we're going to talk about the project, and we're going to talk about planning, and then we're going to get, uh, after we do that, which might be today, might wrap it up today, it might not wrap it up today, but then we'll, we'll get into actual database stuff. All right. But first, a few loose ends. These are things that when I scan through the book, um, I notice we didn't talk about them yet, and it's probably worth talking about, spending at least a few minutes talking about them. Keep in mind, I don't think it's my obligation to cover every word in the book. So I make no... Uh, pretense that, that I'm going to cover everything. But, you know, as I was scanning through, because this is sort of a, uh, a logical break. If we had a midterm in this class, like now would be the midterm, right? Probably right after I talked about the project design would be the midterm, because the database is like a whole uh, new branch of, of what we're going into. So it seemed to make sense for me at the time to take a step back and say, okay, is there anything I missed, anything that I didn't cover that would be exciting? Uh, to cover. So let me look at my notes here. Let me start Visual Studio.
first thing is from an old chapter, and that is validation groups. All right. What this is useful for is if you have sections to your form. All right. Um, Typically, we've been putting our validation error messages like right next to the form field. And that's a pretty good idea. All right? you know, that's usually the way I would prefer to do it. However, there might be cases where you don't necessarily want to put them next to them, but you might, might want to group them together in a common area, especially if you have different sections to your form. I'm thinking, for example, a, a form where you're ordering something and there's like your, your name and billing address. There's like your shipping address, uh, credit card information, and all that. Those are distinct groups of fields. All right. You can even use a field set in your form, the HTML tag field set, to differentiate those. Well, you might decide that I want to clump all the errors together from, say, the general information in one spot, the shipping information in another, and the credit card in another. You might not. I don't know. <laughs> you know, this is just again, you know, part of my part of part of the work here is learning what you can do. All right. Then part of your work is to figure out of all the tools that you know, which do you want to apply in a particular situation. So let me go in and let me just create a pro website. And I'll call it miscellaneous because that's kind of what it is. Create an empty website. Put it on the desktop and call it MISC. create my web page. Now again, this being that it's an example, I'm not going to make it look pretty or anything. Um, I just want to make sure you have the, the idea down. Form, I'm going to put in a field set. And I'm going to put just a couple of text boxes in here without really worrying too much about what they are meant to represent. set. Oops. And I'll give it a couple of text boxes. sets, all right, with each two text boxes. So let me put some validation controls on, on these guys. And I'll, I'll start out by putting validation controls just on the first field set. So I'll go to validation, and I will make this one a required field validator, and I'll make this one a required field validator, all right. And my error message I'm having a heck of a time navigating today. Air field one. Oh, that's actually field two. 
and I will associate it with text box 2. In this one, we will give the error message of error field 1. And we will associate that with text box 1. Now, this is, this is really just what we've done since probably the first or second week of the class. I'll go and add a button here so that we can make it happen. All right. So now when I go and run this, When I go and click on the button, of course, since there's nothing in there, it's going to give me validation errors for those two things. So let's go put the error messages right next to them. So if I go hit button, gives me error 1, error 2. Alright, so that's what we've been doing all along. But there might be another way we might want to do it. I might just want to put, for example, maybe like an asterisk next to the field that's wrong and then put a more detailed message elsewhere on the page. Alright, let's look at doing that. So I can go here and if you look, associated with the validator there's an error message, and then there's a text field. All right. If you leave out the text field, it uses the error message in both places. But if you put something in the text field, then that's what's actually going to display next to the control. That's what's going to actually display where the error validator is, or the required validator. So I'm just going to put an asterisk here, and I'll go and put an asterisk there. All right, go and run this. Now we get an error displayed as an asterisk, but it doesn't really say what the full text of the error is. The full text of the error is the thing that I'm saying I might want to appear somewhere else on the page. All right. Maybe I want it to appear like somewhere over here, the full error. Well, I have a validation summary that I can go drag here. All right. And with each validator, I can give, with each validation control, I can give a validation group. So, for example, if this was a shipping info, I could put shipping info for the first field validator and shipping info for the second field validator. When I then create my validation summary, I say for what um, validation group it's for. So this is for my shipping info. So now if I go and run this, Yes, you had a question. Uh, no, never mind. Okay. Let's look at the code. For uh, field error two, you have a space in between the shipping info validator group. Ah. I wonder if that's given me grief.
I don't know if I can like, turn something off or what. We go and delete these two validation controls. validator for the second one. Alright, let's go and run this. summary here. Alright, get the error in both places. We change this to have a different text. group and let's go and add that back in and we'll call it the group is ship let's say and this validation summary is also for ship and let's see if that works 